have men come and beat the door, the dressing doors down. I mean, and, and look at me thinking I was ready to just right then and there. And I'm wondering what's going on with what's happening. Joyce Bryant, once called the bronze blonde bombshell, died two years ago. Her family has now revealed some shocking news about her life. What were these awful rumors? And why did they wait so long to confirm them? Uh, seriously, I hate to say in bed, living up to that image, people have this so sexy, this whatever it is. Oh, that's I mean, a pressure. This fantasy that they oh. have. Seriously. Jay Joyce was famous for her beauty and voice, but her life had many struggles. What really happened and how did it affect her legacy? I don't know. It's so silly, but I think I wanted to leave home. I wanted to get away from the diapers and all of that. I have a huge family. Few know Joyce Bryant's devastating life story and the chilling reason she turned her back on fame and fortune. Wondering why she isn't a household name? Well, by the age of 28, she'd given up the glamour, the big bucks, and the fame and turned her focus on helping the needy and fighting discrimination in America. It was an incredible and abrupt turnaround, but she was far from finished. There were still more surprising twists and turns ahead. Born in Oakland, California, and raised in San Francisco, her father, Whitfield W. Bryant, worked as a chef for the Southern Pacific Railroad. As a child, Bryant may not have felt so special. You see, her parents were on a baby-making spree. When they finally tallied them all up, the Bryants had eight children. If you think this meant they ran a wild household, think again. No simple pleasures like a movie or a dance or, or, or listening to records or, or whatever. These parents had a very good reason for ruling with an iron fist. The Bryant family were Seventh-day Adventists, and that meant there were restrictions when it came to what the kids ate, drank, and wore. When Bryant started articulating what she wanted to be when she grew up, her parents said no to any kind of job that would go against what the church taught. When Bryant finally decided on a career, it was the last thing her parents wanted to hear. At a very early, early, early age. It was ridiculous, too. It was a ridiculous age at 14. 14, oh, yeah. 14. years 14. old. Bryant always dreamed of being a singer, but her parents had other plans. They didn't think show business was the right place for a nice Seventh-day Adventist girl. Her mom and dad quickly shut down her hopes of a singing career, so Bryant had to put that dream aside for a while. But life at home wasn't easy for her. She felt trapped and wanted to escape her strict upbringing. I don't know, it's so silly, but I think I wanted to leave home. I wanted to get away from the diapers and all of that. I have a huge family. At just 14 years old, Bryant came up with a bold and risky plan to get away. She ran off with her much older boyfriend and the two secretly got married. But her mom wasn't about to let that happen. On their wedding night, Bryant's mom found them and forced the marriage to be annulled. Her parents weren't happy with her choices, so they decided to come up with a new plan to fix things. Their plan was to send Bryant to live with her cousins in Los Angeles, hoping it would straighten her out. But things didn't go the way her parents expected. In LA, her cousins took her to a nightclub for a sing-along. While everyone started singing together, something surprising happened. After a few songs, Bryant noticed that she was the only one singing. Everyone else had stopped to listen to her because her voice was so beautiful. The club owner was amazed by her talent and offered her $25 to sing on stage. Bryant knew her parents wouldn't approve, but she said yes anyway. That single performance turned into a two-week job that paid her $250. Her singing career was starting to take off. Her big break came when she replaced a famous singer, Pearl Bailey, who couldn't perform because of laryngitis. Bryant stepped in and impressed everyone at Cairo's club in Hollywood. This success gave her the confidence to make a huge decision. Bryant believed her future was in New York City, so she took the leap and moved there. She got a regular singing job at La Martinique, where she earned an incredible $400 a week. Then she landed a tour in the Catskill Mountains, performing 118 shows. Bryant was quickly becoming a star. Imagine being on the same stage as Josephine Baker, one of the biggest stars in the world. That's where Joyce Bryant found herself. She wasn't going to let this chance pass her by. She was supposed to do an opening for her. But how could she stand out when the competition was so fierce? Joyce needed to do something unforgettable. Uh, I've heard so much about her. She was, and it's true, she just ripped the audience inside out without out having opened her mouth. So what was she going to do? She performed. And what was I going to do? Being on stage with her. She decided to make a big splash 
And boy, did she. One day before the show, Joyce was at home thinking about how to grab everyone's attention. Then she had a wild idea. She found a can of silver radiator paint lying around. Yes, radiator paint, the kind you use on heaters. Joyce started painting her hair silver. It was risky, but she wasn't done yet. Next, she grabbed some silver fingernail polish and gave herself matching silver nails. I came up with the idea to paint my hair. And I coated my hair with lanolin. And I used radiator paint and painted my hair on silver. Her look was starting to come together, but she needed something more. That's when she thought of her gown. She chose a dress designed by Zelda Wynn Valdez, a famous designer who later created the bunny costume for Playboy. The gown was perfect. It was silver, super tight, backless, and showed off her curves. Now she was ready to shine. When Joyce stepped onto the stage, the audience froze. Every eye was on her. The silver hair, nails, and gown made her look like a glamorous goddess. Her outfit wasn't just bold, it was daring. But the real magic began when she started to sing. And, um, uh, and Joyce had an incredible voice with a range that could cover four octaves. Her singing left the crowd speechless. It was like her silver look and her powerful voice worked together perfectly. It was more than a performance. It was an experience. The audience loved her and so did the media. Reporters gave her nicknames like the Bronze Blonde and the Black Marilyn Monroe. Joyce Bryant had created her own brand. She wasn't just a singer anymore. She was a star. Her silver hair and daring gowns became her signature look. Every time she performed, people couldn't wait to see what she'd wear or how she'd wow them next. Joyce Bryant showed the world that being bold and creative could make you unforgettable. That night, she didn't just perform, she made history. Bryant was soon headlining her own shows, and that's when the nickname started The Bronze Bombshell. That whistle, now in Washington, D.C., at the Casino Royal. This club invited Bryant to be one of its first black entertainers. Imagine being asked to do something that no one like you has done before, especially in a time when racism was everywhere. At first, she wasn't sure about taking the job because the club mostly catered to white people. But when she arrived, she was surprised. Many black patrons were there, and the staff treated them with the respect they deserved. It gave her hope that times were starting to change, even if not everywhere. But things were much harder in Miami, Florida in the 1950s. Back then, black people were only seen as maids or hotel workers, not performers or guests. It was in this hostile environment that Bryant got a shocking offer to become the first black performer at the Hotel Algiers. Performing at the Hotel Algiers was risky for everyone involved. The hotel itself was taking a chance by hiring Bryant. No Miami Beach hotel had ever allowed a black entertainer to perform on their stage before 1952. But the real danger was for Bryant. Racism in the South was not just rude, it was downright dangerous. And it did, it brought about a lot of stuff. It brought about burning crosses and um, threats. Even though the hotel invited her to sing, they still wouldn't treat her equally. She couldn't stay in one of their rooms because she was black. To make things worse, they didn't want her to be seen outside the hotel. They wouldn't even let her take a picture near the building. Then things got even scarier. Before her performance, someone made a life-size doll, or effigy, of Bryant and burned it in public. This was meant to scare her and send a hateful message. It was clear that some people didn't want her to succeed. Bryant had a tough choice, cancel her performance and stay safe, or go on stage and prove she wouldn't be intimidated. Ed wanted me to wear a bandana. Bryant didn't let the threat stop her. She courageously took the stage at the Hotel Algiers. The audience loved her performance, and it became a turning point. After that, Bryant performed regularly in Miami, opening doors for other black entertainers to follow in her footsteps. Another example where she faced racism and colorism was when she was asked to perform on The Ed Sullivan Show, one of the most popular TV shows at the time. Ed Sullivan, who was known for his conservative views, saw what Joyce was going to wear and suddenly had an opinion. 
He told her to wear a bandana on her head while performing, which seemed very odd. His suggestion was seen as an attempt to make her look more like the racist stereotypes of black women during that time. Joyce was shocked and upset by this request. She didn't want to be treated like that, and she wasn't going to let anyone tell her how to look or act. She and Ed Sullivan argued for hours. People later said that Sullivan's request was a way of reminding Joyce of her place in society, but she wasn't having it. Joyce proudly refused to wear the bandana, showing everyone she wouldn't let anyone put her down. By the 1950s, Bryant was now taking home a tidy sum of $3,500 for a single performance. She'd broken down several color barriers in the entertainment industry, and yet she was not happy. For one thing, that radiator paint had done some weird and permanent damage to her hair. But there was something much more serious than that. Bryant was having a moral crisis, and she was desperate to overcome it. They didn't think about the person inside. I was a sex Never. symbol, and as far as they were concerned, I was sleeping every trip, my every little, every ladder, every rung of the ladder. I slept my way up. Aside from her moral crisis, Bryant had a health crisis too. After having a tonsillectomy, Bryant faced a shocking situation that changed her life. Her manager, who should have been looking out for her health, pressured her to use cocaine as a way to help her perform. The manager didn't care about her well-being. All he cared about was her ability to make money. He wanted her back on the stage, even if it meant using dangerous drugs. The problem started when Brian's voice gave out from performing too much. Her manager brought in a doctor to help. The doctor suggested spraying her throat with a dangerous drug and warned the manager that it could make Brian addicted. But instead of caring about her health, her manager didn't care what drug was used as long as it got her on stage. He even said he needed the money to pay for his kid's education. Bryant couldn't believe her ears. The person who should have been protecting her was now putting her in danger. Bryant refused to take the drug, but as a professional, she still had to perform. She later admitted that her performance that night wasn't great. She could barely sing, but tried to joke around by calling it more of a fashion show than a concert. That night, Bryant realized how bad things had gotten. The incident with her manager opened her eyes to the truth she needed to leave the industry. It was a turning point for her, and she made the decision to stand up for herself. I used to have men come and beat the door, the dressing room doors down. I mean, and, and look at me thinking I was ready to just right then and there. And I'm wondering what's going on with you, what's happening? Remember that Byron was raised in a very conservative home as her parents were Seventh-day Adventists. They taught her values about modesty. However, as she entered the entertainment industry, she found herself doing things that didn't feel right. At first, it wasn't just the attention from men that bothered her, even though that made her uncomfortable. She began to feel like everything around her was wrong. As she looked at herself performing on stage in tight, revealing outfits, she couldn't ignore how much of a focus was placed on her body. She had always been taught to value herself for who she was, not for how she looked. But in the show business, it felt like that's all people cared about. And I'm wondering, what's going on with you? What's happening? I didn't know that I exuded that kind of thing or that kind of sensuality. Brian's performances were often highly sexualized. She wore dresses that were so tight she couldn't sit down comfortably. And walking downstairs was almost impossible. She had to be carried on and off stage by others because her clothes were so restricting. Some people even said her energetic arm movements on stage were because her dresses were so tight and she couldn't move any other way. It wasn't just about fashion, it was about how little she could actually move in those outfits. Strangely though, Bryant didn't follow a strict diet to keep her figure. She was burning a lot of calories from her intense performances, and someone even calculated that she lost a full pound with each show she did. She wasn't following any of the trendy diets of the time, like keto or paleo. In a way, she was creating her own belter diet just by performing. But there was more to Joyce Bryant than her looks and performances. The media often compared her to Marilyn Monroe, calling her the black Marilyn Monroe. Bryant didn't like this comparison at all. She didn't see what they had in common except for wearing glamorous dresses. Bryant was her own person, and she felt like the media didn't understand that. She once said, why compare me to her? I was doing my own thing, and she really was. However, the attention and pressure were taking a toll on her. One day, a man who had made advances on her didn't like it when she rejected him. He came to her dressing room and brutally assaulted her. This was the breaking point for Bryant. She realized that she didn't want to continue in a business that treated her this way. Despite being at the peak of her career, 
she decided it was time to leave show business behind. Uh, seriously, I hate to say it, in bed, living up to that image, people have this, oh, sexy, this, whatever it is. Oh, that's I mean, a pressure. This fantasy that they oh. have. Seriously. Her decision shocked everyone. She was earning $200,000 a year, and the media couldn't believe she would give it up. Ebony Magazine even ran a headline that said, the new world of Joyce Bryant, former cafe singer, gives up $200, Zero, zero, zero a year career to learn to serve God. Most people thought this was just a headline to sell magazines, but it was true. Bryant wanted to live a life that aligned with her values and beliefs. She turned her back on fame and fortune to focus on serving God. She turned back to the Seventh-day Adventist church, but that didn't mean she was going to live with her family again. Instead, at 28 years old, Bryant moved to Alabama and enrolled in a Seventh-day Adventist college. But Bryant wasn't interested in hiding in books or getting lost in schoolwork. She was ready to make a difference in the world. After finishing her studies, she started traveling across the South. What she saw shocked her. Hospitals were turning away black people who needed care simply because of their skin color. This made Bryant angry and upset. She couldn't sit by and watch, so she began organizing fundraising events to help. She raised money to buy clothes, food, and medicine for people in need. However, Bryant soon realized that no matter how much money she raised, it wasn't enough to help everyone who needed it. So she turned to something she had always been good at, singing. While organizing the charity events, Bryant saw that music could bring in more donations. So she decided to sing for the cause. But this time there were no fancy dresses or silver hair and she didn't wear any makeup. She just sang and the money started coming in. Singing helped Bryant become well known again. But this time, it wasn't just for her talent. It was for her work helping the community. One person who noticed Bryant's efforts was Martin Luther King Jr. He had always admired her singing, but now he was interested in working with her because of her charitable actions. Bryant and Dr. King often met to discuss how to help black communities get the basic things they needed. Their conversations inspired Bryant to take her work to a bigger level. Before, Bryant just wanted to provide food, clothing, and medical help to black families. But after talking to Dr. King, she started thinking about a much larger goal. She didn't just want to give people things they needed. She wanted to change the whole system. Bryant wanted to end the unfair treatment of black people in America. Her first step was to go back to the Seventh-day Adventist church, hoping they would support her new mission. But when she reached out, she didn't get the answer she had hoped for. I opened that hotel for and, him. And broke the color barrier. And broke the color barrier. In Miami there. Beach. Yes. Yes. Bryant was disappointed, but she didn't give up. She knew there was still much work to be done, and she wasn't afraid to keep pushing forward, even when things didn't go the way she expected. Through her music and her hard work, Bryant continued to fight for a better future where people, no matter their race, could live with dignity and equality. One day, they sent her to Washington, D.C., where she worked with children in a kindergarten class. It was here, while singing for the kids, that something amazing happened. A voice teacher named Frederick Wilkerson was visiting the classroom. When he heard Bryant sing, he was shocked. He recognized her voice and couldn't believe it was her. But after confirming it was indeed her, he saw an opportunity. Wilkerson knew that Bryant didn't want to go back to singing in clubs or bars, but he had another plan for her. He wanted to train her voice in a new classical style. Bryant agreed, and after working with him for a while, she was ready to perform in a whole new way. By the 1960s, Bryant was performing with symphonies in places like Rochester and Washington, and she even went to Europe to sing. Her life had changed completely. But soon, someone from her past came back into the picture, Howard Sanders. In 1965, Sanders reminded her of a promise he had made years before. He had created a place for Bryant to sing, a restaurant in New York City called Clio. Even though it was a little too similar to her old life, Bryant agreed to perform, but with some strict rules. Bryant made it clear that she wasn't going to sing pop songs. Instead, she would sing classical and spiritual songs. The crowds loved it. They came from all over just to hear her sing. But this created a problem for Sanders. The customers were so focused on Bryant's voice that they forgot to order food. Since it was a restaurant, this hurt business. After just five nights, Sanders fired her. Although this setback was tough, Bryant didn't give up. She took a job performing on a cruise ship. While on the ship, she met a conductor who worked with Sammy Davis Jr. This led to Bryant appearing on Davis's TV show, and her career got another chance to shine. 
She was even considered for a role in the famous musical Carmen Jones, a part that could have made her a huge star. However, the role ended up going to Dorothy Dandridge instead. Despite these ups and downs, Bryant kept moving forward. By the 1980s, she stopped performing, but she didn't leave music behind. She became a vocal coach, teaching stars like Raquel Welch and Jennifer Holliday how to sing. Even in her later years, she still loved music and shared her talents with others. Joyce Bryant passed away peacefully on November 20th, 2022, at the age of 95. She had been living with Alzheimer's disease and diabetes for some time, and her niece, Robin LeBeau, had been caring for her in the last 10 years of her life. Though her life was full of challenges, Joyce Bryant's voice always stood out, and she left behind a legacy in both music and teaching.